Assalamu alaikum everybody and welcome back to The Y Factor. We have a very special episode for you guys and when I mean special I really mean it. We have Dr. Tariq Aswaydan in the studio right now. If you don't know who he is, you seriously live under a rock. He is a general manager of Ar Risala Satellite TV station. He's a chairman of Ar um, Rawad Leadership Training Center. He's also a professional trainer in leadership and management, one of the leading Islamic scholars in regards to leadership um, within our Ummah. And he's joining us in the studio right now. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Uh, alaykum Tariq, salam. and welcome to the program. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, and thank you for the invitation. It's our pleasure to have you here. Um, we have so much to talk about in so little time, so we'll inshallah narrow it down to um, a few main topics inshallah. Um, you're here as part of a tour in Sydney. Um, what is the purpose of your tour, Dr. Tariq? Barakallah fikum. I'm here um, besides enjoying Australia. <laughs> I, I came from Kuwait, it's 48 degrees there. Wow. So, <laughs> to rain and cold here. So I, I, I found an excuse to leave. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I am here by the invitation by Human Appeals International and uh, the tour has a multi-purpose. Part of it is Islamic uh, knowledge, uh, spreading Islamic knowledge among the community. The other one is training on leadership and management uh, for the um, executives and the youth and the third part of it is uh, fundraising dinners for uh, Syria and several places. Mashallah. Well I, I guess I mean you're, you're known around the the world as well as especially in the Middle East for your management and uh, strategic planning training so and your motivational speaking so I suppose it's a fantastic tour for people to actually come down and, and enjoy while he's here. Uh, it's a rare opportunity. Um, I guess to to start off with, perhaps we can talk about... Uh, well, maybe the very question of why plan your life. I mean, uh -huh. one of the seminars that you held this week part of, as part of the tour was how to plan your life. So yeah. why do that? Why not live every day by day? <laughs> um, I did uh, two seminars on planning your life, one in Melbourne and one uh, in uh, Sydney. And uh, alhamdulillah, the attendance was mostly the youth. It is very important for the youth to plan their lives. Uh, it, studies have shown very clearly that those who do plan their lives achieve about 96% of their goals, while those who don't usually don't exceed 4% only. So that's an enough reason to plan your life. Uh, the, another reason that I throw in my seminars on this is this Ummah, uh, Islamic Ummah, has been uh, backward for more than 400 years, and we need every effort to revive the Ummah again. For, so for those who live day by day, they will not really be part of the revival of the Ummah. Um, it is very important that you choose your field correctly. Uh, some, uh, so many students have gone into fields in universities and then discovered this is not what they want in life. Yeah. Um, uh, unfortunately, it comes sometimes after they graduate by several years and it's already they cannot change their lives. While if the if you plan your life early, then you choose your field correctly. You field you choose your goals and projects in life correctly, and then you have major achievements. Um, I have done this myself. Uh, before I planned my life, uh, there was a lot of production, but scattered. Um, after I planned my life, it was directed and it was uh, very effective. So it is very important to plan your life, and you'll see major results when you do that. So in a few simple steps, Doctor, can you um, outline for us how one can go about doing that? Yes, definitely. Um, in, uh, uh, I teach it usually in six hours. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we have a few minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll give you a few minutes. Uh, so please remember that these are only the titles. The first thing you should do is check, are you in the right field? Are you in, in the right college, for example? Uh, uh, many students have been in a, or, or went into a college because of pressures by their parents or because a, a friend of theirs uh, told them this is a nice subject, but that's not really what they want. Mm. So the most important thing is that to check that you are in the right field. And to check you are in the right field, you must check, is this what you have a passion for? Mm. That's the uh, number one issue. Uh, the second thing is, what are the, what are the chances that you will have an opportunity after you graduate to work in that field. There are people who graduated in a field and then they discovered there are no jobs, no uh, uh, opportunities, and they had to switch. Um, for your information, the percentage of those who work 
in an area that is not related to their field is about 80%. Subhanallah. No, it's I a lot. Died. It is a lot. Wow. So I studied psychology and work in marketing. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, right. One example. Right. Right. was a prime example. <laughs> and, and, uh, for myself, I, I studied petroleum engineering and I'm, I'm not in petroleum anymore. So this is not natural. This is normal. And the reason for it is that people did not plan their lives and realized later on that it is not their field. Uh, a third thing that you should ch uh, check always, do you have the uh, right abilities for this field, not only to succeed, but to excel and uh, be, be better than your colleagues and uh, peers and so on. So this is the, the major thing. The other major thing is, what are the major projects you would like to achieve in your life? I'm talking 15, 20 years from now. Um, mm. What do you dream of? If you don't have a dream, you really cannot achieve much. So uh, the whole uh, life planning really starts with uh, this end uh, of life, and that is what is the right field for you. And the other end, say 30 years from now, if you would like to tell your grandchildren, for example, that uh, I have done this, I have done that, what are you going to tell them? So what are the projects? What are the achievements? Uh, if these two are very clear, then we teach you how to move from here to there. And I guess the most important, what effect do you leave behind once you actually die? So what, yeah, what, so benef we, what benefit do you bring to the actual yeah, Ummah itself? We, we, we say it in another way, is what is your legacy? Mm. <clears throat> so many people, uh, the, the percentage of people who live and die without leaving any mark on life is 98%. Mm. <laughs> so it is uh, um, uh, your choice. And you, you, I tell this generation uh, that uh, you're very lucky. You had people talking to you about life planning, leadership, management. In our time, there was no one talking about such things. So now, uh, please uh, grasp uh, the opportunity and do plan your life. Um, doctor, on that statistic, what would you put it down to? Would you put it down to laziness, ignorance? Because um, no, it's a high percentage. Yeah, it is a very high percentage. And uh, the, reason, the main reason for it is ignorance. People don't know how to plan their lives. Nobody have motivated them or even uh, mentioned it. So, so many people, like myself, I, I, the first time I heard about it is after I graduated by several years. Mm. So uh, if you have... Mentors, if you have um, parents who are aware of such a thing, if you have a teacher who would motivate you to, at, or at least you attended like one of our seminars, then you will wake up and you understand the importance of it. 98% of people don't have that opportunity. So they just go, as uh, my daughter said, day by day. And, and <laughs> by the way, some people do it intentionally. Say, to, to be serious about life, to have... Uh, excellent production, it takes effort, it takes mm. time. So they say, I don't want to do that. I just want to live a normal life. Yeah, you live a normal life, you die at a normal death and uh, you leave no mark. Mm. Well, often for a lot of these people, it might just be that they can't find their purpose. You know, you like a lot of different areas, you have a lot of different interests yes, and skills, but you, how do you hone it down to the one focus? Okay, uh, from my experience, I, I, I trained more than 60,000 people. Oh, and uh, in my experience, there are two kinds of people who become confused. Those who have no talents at all become confused because they, they don't have the talent for anything. The other uh, kind of people who get confused are those who have a lot of talents. They also get confused because they can do politics, they can do investment, they can do da'wah, they can... So, um, because they can do so many things and they want to do so many things, and especially, mashallah, in universities, if they are active and so on, they will get involved in everything. And what will happen is, uh, as the... Americans say you spread your your production too thin. Mm -hmm. So in every area you produce, but it is very little. So you don't leave a mark. So my advice is even if you have so many talents and you're fit to do so many fields, it is so important to concentrate and focus on one field only. And how do you choose that field? You have to choose it on three criteria, three main criteria. The first one is what do you love? Or what is your desire? What is your passion? The, the field that you enjoy more, that is one. The second main uh, uh, criteria is what are the opportunities of doing an outstanding work after you graduate? And the third one is what, are the, what, are, what is the field that is more fit with your talents? So you, you can do politics and you can do economics, for example. 
but you can do politics a little more. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you have to check all of that. If you're still confused, then you would need the help of a mentor. Okay. Um, well, okay, that brings up another question as well. You were mentioning people who are spread very thinly across a lot of areas. This often happens with a lot of people who are involved either in um, community work or dawa, mm -hmm. and you find that after a while they're burnt out from just that, how much they're doing. That is true. So how do you, first of all, avoid being, you know, off-put by this burnout? Mm -hmm. And secondly, if you do reach that phase, how do you get out of it? Yes. Um, when I was a student <coughs> in the United States, I, I was involved in so many things. And um, yes, it is exhausting. But uh, two things really will, will help a lot. The first one is when you do the life plan, then you focus only in one area. Um, for those who have talent and motivation, the hardest thing to do is to say no. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> So you're invited to a da'wah program, you go. You're invited to a scholarly program, you go. Your political, uh, you go. And the activism, you go. And uh, you, you can't continue to do that. You have to focus in one area. So that's, uh, I don't mind students, if they are new, especially to a university, to try different things. Because actually what they are doing here is that they, dis they are discovering what is, what is their passion. Which is fine. So it is okay to involve in many things, but when you discover your passion and ability, then you concentrate on it. So that is one thing that will help you. The other thing, and that's a very important question, how do you avoid being burned out? Uh, <clears throat> two things. The first one is to have a major goal in life. Like for, for myself, my major goal is to revive a, a sleeping ummah. Mm. And, and when you have this huge goal in your mind, you, uh, no matter how much you bend out, you still work because, again, this is your goal in life. The second thing, which is, um, uh, and unfortunately, very few people talk about it, is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that gives us an answer, a direct answer to this question. Uh, the hadith says that whenever you do um, uh, work, for every work, shira, a maximum. And for each maximum, or for each work, there is a minimum. So, in short, and the hadith continues, in short, put a minimum and put a maximum. Move up and down, but within these two limits. Mm -hmm. Never cross the minimum. So, what, what is the minimum? The minimum is that... You keep your prayers on time, you do the obligations, you don't go to and do major sins. This is the minimum. So even if you are lazy and so on for a few days and uh, you, you don't produce anything or you don't share any activity, that is fine as long as you keep the major issues in line. Don't cross them. So when it is very clear for you, the Prophet tells us this is yes. the human no nature. That it, sometimes you're very active, you're very motivated, and sometimes you get tired, you get lazy. Fine. It is acceptable. It is, it is not wrong. But when you cross the minimum and you go below it, then you're in danger. And just on that point, you were speaking about um, you know, juggling your commitments yeah. as uni students. How do you strike a balance, Doctor, on, on top okay. of what you said? Yeah. How do you strike a balance with da'wa work, you know, community work, also your university, if you want to hone in and yes. focus and, on that? And yeah. trying to, to, I guess, uh, always improve your deen. Yeah. As well. That's right. Uh, this is also a very important uh, question because part of the life planning seminar is a, a full exercise called a balanced life. And in, t in that, we have uh, five criteria. Uh, your body and health is one. Social uh, relations and emotions is the other one. The third one is your sp spirituality and worship. The fourth one is your knowledge and uh, skills. And the fifth one is your wealth and uh, abilities. And in each one, we give them 10 criteria. So you check. You actually check. It's like a checklist. It is a checklist. And uh, you will find uh, which areas are weak. So that's one concept. And uh, uh, if, if we had more time, I would have detailed it. 
but uh, there is a, an exercise for those who attended with me and they can spread it and um, uh, I don't have a, I tell my students and the attendees uh, no copyrights oh, beautiful, yeah. <laughs> send it to everyone because I took note at your building uh, civilization I, and I sent I emailed yeah, it to about 20 so people just so. use it please Alhamdulillah. so th this is one side the other thing is to remember what is a balanced life is it dividing your life equally say 20% for work, 20% for spirituality, 20% for relations, 20% for knowledge, and 20% for sleeping. <laughs> Is it that way? No. A balanced life doesn't have fixed percentages. People have to understand this. It, it is different, first of all, from one person to another. And it is different for the same person from one time to another. So when you are a student, it's different when you graduate. When you are a student at exam times, it is different than when you're in a relaxed time or in a vacation. So don't have fixed percentages. That is not a balanced life. It's, it's the understanding that it is, uh, it is something that you adjust all the time, continuously. That's what will give you a balanced life. The, the, the major issue to understand here is that you put a minimum in each area. For example, your relation with your parents, and suppose you're a student away from your parents. So for example, I'm here away from my uh, family. Uh, I make it a point that I will call them every day. Mm -hmm. How much will it cost? But I don't <laughs> call them every week. Some students do that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Why? Why do you do? I mean, just say "Assalamu alaikum" five minutes. At least keep this relation going. So there is a minimum. Set a minimum. Set a minimum for your worship. Set a minimum for your uh, knowledge. Set, and again, uh, you adjust above the minimum, but never cross the minimum. And I guess also always uh, also set your priorities as well. Uh, priorities. Uh, my advice on this is uh, to have three kinds of priorities. Uh, set your priorities and set your uh, projects for 20 years ahead and set priorities and projects for five years and set priorities and projects for the next 12 months. So this is my advice. One year plan, five years plan and 20 years plan. And it, it really works. Inshallah. Well, I, I guess it's a solid advice from somebody who uh, I guess everybody could see as a word to describe you would be uh, achieved or achievements. <laughs> so, <laughs> mashallah. mashallah. Well, actually, another word I've heard you described as is the advocate for women. Apparently, that's your nickname in Kuwait. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my name in the Arab world. Okay. Well, <laughs> do you have any specific advice tailored at young Muslim women? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, looking at um, Muslim women, not only in the Middle East, but all over, I find it really, really challenging for a woman and a Muslim woman, more than it is challenging for a man to succeed in, in this life. Uh, there are a lot of obstacles, uh, there are a lot of demands, and uh, she is expected if she gets married and have children to balance her life and take care of a husband and take care of a family, which is a huge undertaking, a huge undertaking. So uh, to do it, we must enable women and give them a lot of support. And uh, really, really, we really need to change the mentality of the men and make them understand that women share in the building of civilization. And it is his duty to babysit. Great. <laughs> 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 I hope everybody's listening. It's a listening. Share, shared duty, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? It's a shared duty. It is yeah. not the woman. So, because some men look at it, that this is not my responsibility. And uh, uh, to educate and give tarbiyah to the kids. They look at it, this is a woman's job. Not, this is not true. This is shared by both. Um, who raised the children of the Prophet ﷺ? Was it Khadija? No, it was Khadija and the Prophet ﷺ at the same time. So uh, this is a huge challenge. And that is for a woman to insist that her spouse should share in, uh, in her education, in her support and in, in children. Uh, of course, women will have also a huge um, undertaking because the studies have shown, and this is another subject that I talked about in my seminars here in Australia, and that is a woman leader. And it is, uh, studies are very clear throughout the world that this is a man's world. Even in the West, it is a man's world. 
Women who have the same knowledge, same degree, same experience, get 71% of the salaries of men. The glass ceiling. So there is a glass ceiling also. Uh, those who reached the top positions in the world are uh, among women. If you take all the major positions, I'm talking about presidents, uh, members of the congresses, the parliaments, and the ministers, and so on. It's only half of 1%. So, uh, again, it's, it's difficult not only for a Muslim woman, it's, uh, it's difficult for any woman. Uh, here, what, you, what would I, I would advise is that, first of all, women take it seriously and take their careers also seriously. But my, uh, another major uh, advice is that they must get together and create a society that would advocate women's rights and advocate uh, the presence of women in every area. There is a world uh, society that is doing that and uh, our sisters can be part of that and get a lot of support from them. It's called Catalyst. Mm. It's Catalyst is a, uh, is a huge organization that is directed for research on women and supporting women, uh, uh, women rights and women place in society. Speaking of women, a lot of women were involved in the Arab Spring, yes. you know, the revolutionary wave of protests and demonstrations. Mm. Um, you mentioned in your talk it was a turning point in history. Um, and you also said the hope of the Ummah is in its youth. What yes. did you mean by that? Um, uh, many of my students have uh, been in these demonstrations and some of them have started these demonstrations. <laughs> Subhanallah. My daughter, uh, Maysoon, uh, was studying in Egypt and still, and she uh, participated in the Egyptian revolution from day one to the fall of uh, Mubarak, every day. Uh, ten times hit by tear gas and so on. Wow. So, Khair, inshallah. so yeah, 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 when we teach, we must uh, practice and yeah. this is part of what we teach. So yes, uh, it, it is dangerous. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, it is something that is challenging for a woman, even more uh, young woman, more than a young man. But Alhamdulillah, uh, we have a new generation. I have been Alhamdulillah involved in da'wah for more than forty-two years, and I tell you, this generation that I see everywhere, from Egypt to Saudi Arabia to Australia to America, etc., had I have not seen such a generation in 42 years. So your generation is, mashallah, amazing. You have the abilities, you have the knowledge, you have the, the, the will, you have the faith, and you have the, uh, the you, you understand the full picture. And of course, technology helped a lot on this, <laughs> really, really, because, for example, in, in the 20 years from now, uh, ago, uh, I, I would say the same things, but it would not reach you. Now, uh, social media, it is. Uh, not only that, I mean, uh, even you're talking about tapes and uh, we had that a long time ago. Now it's on the net and people can download it, etc. My books, for example, uh, now they are on e-books. And so, so uh, again, mm, in the book. past, you had a difficulty to understand life, understand knowledge, uh, get Islamic knowledge. Now there's no excuse. And Alhamdulillah, we have seen the results. Uh, for many girls, for example, it was very difficult to attend into seminars and so on. Now they can get it online even. Mm -hmm. So a lot of change that we see. And um, of course, the major change that we see is a, a change in mentality. And even in Islamic work, you see, Islamic work, 20 years ago, there wasn't really no work for women, for example. Now you see a huge change. So Alhamdulillah, يعني, uh, I, am, I am very optimistic, I'm very pleased with uh, the generation I see and your generation. I remember actually um, about maybe half a year or to a year right before the uprisings actually began, uh, the first actual video I ever saw of you was of you saying this hadith from the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about The future of Islam. Exactly, yes. And then, subhanAllah, you were actually saying in the video, like uh, you, were, you were mentioning, um, it would come to a time where the Ummah was ruled by military dictatorships. Yes. You were saying, look in uh, Syria, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Egypt in, yes. everywhere. And now we have all of these places being overthrown. <laughs> That's true. And uh, I, uh, in my lectures that I did uh, in uh, Egypt after the revolution, uh, uh, see, after the fall of Hosni Mubarak, and until today, inshallah, will be over soon. Uh, uh, the military took over after Hosni Mubarak. Mm. So uh, in my lectures uh, in April in uh, in uh, Egypt last year, so just uh, after the fall of Mubarak, 
I, I, there was a huge attendance of all of them. I mm -hmm. said, look, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that there will come a time when those of power, military power, will rule. Mm -hmm. And then when you get rid of that, then Al Khilafa will come. Mm -hmm. The true Khilafa will come. Never allow the military to rule again. And uh, this became a slogan. La la li hukm al askar. No, no <laughs> to military rule. The, so it is a very important that we are aware that the worst rulers that we can have are the military. Mm. And alhamdulillah, people are very aware of that, especially the youth. And they have insisted on, I, I, really, I really support the demonstrations even today. Because until we get rid of the military rule, we will not revive. And uh, inshallah, in two days, there will be an, uh, elections in Egypt. And uh, inshallah, a civil government will be chosen. Inshallah. I think one thing that we've noticed, especially coming out of the um, Arab Spring and what you were just saying, is there's a lack of leaders, you know, people that you look at and you actually do find an inspiration in them and you want to follow. Yes. Um, so, and you mentioned once that the best youth to be found are the youth in the Western countries, yeah, true. you know, not being biased here because we are from the Western <laughs> country. Alhamdulillah. No Sydney, um, Australia. Well, that is true. <laughs> but if we wanted to find a leader amongst us, no. well, how do we instill that? Can anybody be a leader? Yes. Uh, okay. There are two, uh, two major concepts here. It is so wrong to think of a leader that is a superman this concept uh, i see i uh, once saw a cartoon picture in an islamic magazine where a full army of horses <laughs> all the way to the horizon with the, um, uh, all the equipment and the men riding on the horses ready and there is only one horse a huge horse at the front of all of these horses with all the um, uh, equipment on it but there is no one on it and then the the, the slogan there was, when Salah al-Din will come. Mm. This is garbage. Mm. Oh. This is a wrong idea. We should not promote the idea of a hero that will save us. We should move into the, the, the idea of institutions mm -hmm. that will save us, organizations. So I, um, I'm very well satisfied that there is no hero because a hero is a very dangerous idea because if that hero becomes corrupt or die then we're b back to square one again mm. and it's, it's wrong it's wrong so let's talk about institutions organizations institution for da'wan and another institution for finance another institution for politics uh, women's rights no, forget just wipe away from your brains the idea of a hero i think Yes. That also encourages the, the idea that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't con change a condition of a people until they so change, they change themselves. In themselves. So these organizations are changing, I guess, uh, what's inside yes, Exactly. But, but and then back to the question, uh, uh, and do train yourself as, as leaders. We don't need a leader. Mm -hmm. We need leaders. So when we, when we think about this, then the concept of a hero is uh, thrown away. And we build heroes who can build organizations, have synergy, work together to revive the Ummah. And uh, we don't depend on one person. So uh, uh, there are people who are naturally born leaders. There are people who can be trained to be leaders. So be either one of the two, but don't just sit and wait for a leader. Before we, inshallah, we get on to your tour, because you're also doing a few more events, inshallah. Um, I, I was very curious to know, Doctor, what's the best advice you've ever been told and why? <laughs> Which one Putting you on the spot. Very broad so question. Which one should I choose? Really, we should have a several hour <laughs> yeah, interview. Just for that, just for that question. No, no, really, I, I think the best advice, um, besides the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the best advice I've got is focus. Focus. Don't be scattered. Don't try to do everything. Choose one field, choose few major projects and do them. If you try to do so many things, then you will produce, but you'll be very uh, spreading yourself so thin and you will not leave an impact. So my advice to my daughters and sons, please choose a field, one field. If you like something else, make it a hobby. But one field that you concentrate on and within that field, Choose three to five major projects that you will achieve in life and focus on them. And then 
do everything in that direction. So go and learn, uh, get skills, get training that will support the achievement of these goals. So that's my biggest advice, focus. Very practical advice from a uh, man very much achieved, mashallah. But just before we wrap up, and we really don't want to, this has been an amazing interview, but um, we'll just go through the rest of your tour. So on Friday, inshallah, you'll be giving the khutbah at Punchbowl Musalla, which is on Matthew Street in Punchbowl. So that's going to be at 12 p.m. in Arabic and English, inshallah. Um, do we get a sneak preview of what the khutbah is about? Uh, I will talk about the goals of Sharia. Oh, okay. Oh, so many people talk topic. about the Maqasid laws the sharia. of Sharia. Mm. Mm. And um, uh, uh, it is very clear that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have ordered, whether it's small or major, has a, has a goal behind it. For example, tattoos are haram. Why? Many of our scholars will say, because it's haram. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not because it's haram. Because there is a goal behind it. Because there is a reason behind it. So if you, and that will wake uh, wake many people up. Because um, Alhamdulillah, our young men and women respect scholars. But I would like you to respect scholars in an um, with an open mind. You don't accept a law that has no reason. Yeah, I mean, don't throw your brains away. So I will give a glimpse of the maqasid al-sharia. Okay, well, that's definitely not yeah. something to miss then. Yeah. On Saturday and Sunday, inshallah, you, you're holding a course on discovering and training future leaders. Yes. Um, that's going to be held in the Novotel from 9 to 3 p.m. So um, people should look up Human Appeal International's website for details. And the final thing is public lecture on Monday, inshallah, about the Prophet's biography and contemporary insights. Yes. And that's going to be in the Grand Royale in Granville um, at 7 o'clock in the evening. So, um, inshallah, for more details about all of these, look up Human Appeal International. The whole schedule's on there, prices, registrations. Um, so, let, let me give an example, of, uh, just one example of the last uh, some, I mean, lecture. We read the seerah of the Prophet, and we don't really study the seerah. So, we learn the seerah, we hear the seerah, we enjoy the seerah. <clears throat> So let me ask you uh, just two or three questions that I will answer, inshallah, in the... Oh, alhamdulillah. In the, so. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't study. <laughs> okay, but I, I'd like you to think about it until then. There was a, a migration to Habasha, to Ethiopia. Uh, that migration, we are told, is because Muslims were oppressed. And they, uh, the Prophet ﷺ sent them to Habasha <laughs> to save them. Now, who was the leader of the group that went to Habasha? Ja'far. Ja'far. He was never oppressed. Who was the first person to migrate? Uthman. He was never oppressed. So why would they migrate? So huh? we're not supposed to answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is, so that's this one, one example. Books, one <laughs> <faculty>. <laughs> Another thing on the same issue. Mm. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ did not the continue the migration to Habasha. He was looking for someone else, somewhere else. Why? Why didn't he continue this, sending them to Habasha? After he established the Islamic State in Medina, why didn't he bring those who were sent in Habasha? They stayed seven years after Hijrah. Why didn't they come back? He needed every effort. So these are some of the questions that I so would like. I think yeah. the, the purposes were because of maybe they had goals in mind. They had yes, goals set, so say. So it's really more than that even. It's a strategic plan. Mm. So now we understand when, when we, uh, I teach strategic planning. So when we understand strategic planning, then we would understand Sira even deeper. Mm. I think you've given us a little insight into exactly. what we can expect, inshallah, <laughs> at the talk. Um, Dr. Tariq, Zakalah uh, Khairan, for your time. Wallahi, we appreciate it at the yeah. Life Factor Wish team. Wish we had more. <laughs> Absolutely, inshallah. We, we're aware of your tight schedule um, and we appreciate your time. Zakalah Khairan. Barakallahu yeah, Keep barakallahu the good work. Uh, may Allah bless you and reward you. We hope you and enjoy inshallah. the rest of your tour in Australia. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, come back to Sydney, otherwise, yeah, we'll don't have forget to us. Uh, come <laughs> Please, Doctor, do not forget us. I, I would never. I, I, I love Australia. I don't know why, but I love Australia. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> we didn't pay you to say that. Allah <laughs> 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 One doctor when you're ready. He steps and reaches to touch. This man who suffered so much, his own troubles could not compare. To the prophets. And on that incredible high, I think it's time to end the episode. 
Unfortunately, we have to go, but we hope you've benefited from it, inshallah. We'll be uploading the exclusive interview with Dr. Tarek Aswedan on YouTube so on you guys can website, listen to it. We, know, we understand page. it is um, exam and assessment period at university, but it is well worth your time. You can literally have a pen and paper ready when you do listen to the interview. There are some you know, very viable, um, practical pieces of advice you can take from the interview, inshallah. And on that note, we'd like to leave you with... Uh, and you know what? Let's thank Human Appeal once again for yeah. giving them the opportunity to, you know, um, giving us the opportunity to interview Dr. Tarek Oswedan. Thank you to The Voice of Islam for hosting us every single week. And um, good luck, best of luck, inshallah, for your exams. And we'll be with you again next week with a... Well, I can't say a better episode, not after Dr. Oh, Tarek it's gonna be it's going to be hard to hard. match. It's going to be very hard to match. But stay listening. This is The Voice of Islam. You're listening to The Y Factor on 87.6 FM.